Thanks very much, John. Um, yes, it's an absolute privilege to uh, be uh, Deputy Director of the BRC. And I've been reflecting as we've gone through the day and heard all this amazing work that it was at the back end of 2015 when a whole group of us uh, got together and started really taking seriously the idea that it was time that Bristol had a biomedical research centre um, building on the uh, existing very successful uh, biomedical research units. And it, it is from all those conversations, some quite difficult at that time, and all those agonised discussions about how to what themes were going to be included and how it would be brought together and um, how we would uh, explain our research strengths. To see all of that end up in, uh, in today and real research that's happening has been absolutely fantastic. And nothing uh, has given me greater pleasure than to see that all those discussions have led to these fantastic PhD students who, who through the BRC, starting what will uh, no doubt be highly successful research careers. That's just been great. So I lead the theme on biostatistics, evidence synthesis, and informatics, which, as you can see, is really three sub-themes that Kate and Julian and John will present in a moment. So I'll just say something about each of these, uh, these disciplines. The aim of our theme is to, and you've already seen in all the presentations on the research themes, there's lots of quantitative work uh, requiring these quantitative disciplines. So our aim is to in enhance the research themes activities through coordination, development and application of appropriate quantitative and computational methods. So what are these three things? Well, my discipline originally is in biostatistics and the photo here is of Sir Ronald Aylmer Fisher, who's the genius who, more than anybody else in the first half of the 20th century, established the underpinning principles of both statistical inference and statistical genetics. And so this is, the discipline of, of statistics is, uh, is at least 100 years old in, in the way that it's, it's still practiced today. So the aim of, our, of the biostatistics work is to apply and further develop statistical methods relevant to the research themes, quality assure the research themes, statistical analyses, and ensure career development for our junior staff through training in advanced methods and mentoring and participation in professional groups. Now, it may not be obvious to you, but Fisher in this photo is operating a hand calculator. That's how people used to do their calculations. And back when I was doing masters, and this is a sign of my advancing age, when I was doing my masters at UCL, they were just throwing out their cupboard full of their old hand calculators because they'd finally got to the point where they realized that we were in the computer age and these were never, ever going to be needed ever again. And I do slightly regret that I never grabbed one of those as they were throwing it out. You've already heard that we've moved way beyond that to bigger and bigger data. I mean, there was a discussion when we were talking about uh, one of the epigenetics PhD, uh, PhDs of were they using the 450,000 variant chip for their epigenetics or was it the 850,000 variant chip? So statistics has already got very big. And underpinning our theme, I'd say, uh, we would aim, always aim to distinguish between prediction nowadays using complicated and big data and causal inferences, working out what intervention works. There's a fundamental difference between predicting what's going to happen and saying, what would the, be the effect of doing this instead of doing something else? Again, evidence synthesis has featured a lot through the day. These days, we don't just use summaries of evidence to decide at the end uh, of, of a research process what's the best intervention or treatment, but you've, you've seen in many of the presentations how summaries of the evidence are required for us all to decide what research we need to do. So our themes about application of state-of-the-art methods for systematic reviews and meta-analyses and evidence synthesis. Julian's going to talk more about that. And finally, these days, everyone believes we don't really talk about statistics anymore. We talk about data science and informatics. This logo is for the Connecting Care Data Bank. Already in this area, for a million people, there is a single electronic health record available. And we all want to start to use modern uh, high-performance computers 
to start to uh, access detailed information on patients in a way that's never been possible before in order to improve patient care. All BRCs are required to work on informatics. There are substantial regulatory and practical difficulties in actually doing good research. Uh, so the informatics team will be working on that, and that's what John is going to talk about. So I will hand over to our three sub-theme leads, and we're going to do them not in the order in the program, but in the order BEI. So Kate Tilling is going to talk about biostatistics. Thanks, Jonathan. And then um, when we were listening to you earlier about the, um, how cortisol varies over the day, it did occur to me that perhaps this was not the ideal time to be talking to everyone about statistics, but I'll give it a bash. So I'm just going to give a really brief snapshot of a couple of the challenges that are faced across the various research themes in the BRC and one particular way we've helped to answer a, a clinical question. And two of the challenges are big data, and that means a multitude of things to different people, but in my mind, it means when you collect lots and lots of different information about people. So these days, we can collect genetic information, epigenetics, information from sensors, etc. And with traditional stats methods, it's quite easy to look at each one by itself, but it requires a bit more, more sort of novel methods to draw out the patterns from all those outcomes together. And then the second challenge is of repeated data. So often, if we want to see how well a treatment works, we're interested in how it changes somebody over time. And again, traditional methods can say, were the two groups different three months after the intervention? Were they still different 12 months after the intervention? But to actually get a pattern of overall how the pattern of change proceeded, again, requires slightly different methods. I'm just going to briefly present an example from the perinatal and reproductive health theme. And if you're interested in this example, it was a, it's a poster, um, as you can see more information about it there. But it's basically talking about a trial, a randomized trial um, in pregnant women, a uh, behavior change intervention. And the timeline shows how we've got one of the challenges, which is repeated data. So people were randomized, the women were randomized quite early in pregnancy. They had their outcomes measured at randomization, and then at about 28 weeks and about 35 weeks of gestation. And the second example shows some of the outcomes we were looking at were met metabolites. So you've got 158 metabolic features. Now, for people used to dealing with genetic data, that doesn't count as big data. That counts as very tiny data. But for normal statistical methods, that counts as big data. And we have to think of ways to draw out the patterns from all of those metabolites rather than looking at each one separately. So what we did was, first of all, we did repeated measures models. So we did multi-level models, which allow for each person to be different. So each person is allowed to have their own starting level of metabolites and their own increase over pregnancy. But those are allowed to be related to each other. And importantly, as well as looking at the individual people, it allows us to say whether the intervention tends to lead to a steeper or a less steep increase in the metabolites over pregnancy. And then for the big data, we were grouping together the different kinds of particles to allow more patterns to emerge. So we fitted 158 of these models, one for each type of the metabolic outcomes. And on the left hand, on the vertical axis, you can see the concentration, and the horizontal axis shows weeks of gestation. You just see the gray blobs are the individual values, so quite a lot of variation within people. And the red line shows the population average change. So you can see that these metabolites tend to increase over pregnancy with a steeper increase in the last trimester. Then the big data aspect is grouping this together and allowing it to tell us something about the effect of the intervention. So here we've grouped all the VLDL particles together. And you can see that actually there's a really consistent pattern there where the interventions <coughs> tend to reduce the rate of increase of all these metabolites over gestation and improves the fatty acid profiles. So then we're getting some idea of the mechanisms by which this intervention was affecting outcomes for these obese pregnant women. And so that's just one very short example of how the biostatistics theme is supporting the substantive research themes in answering important clinical questions. Thank you. Ah, good afternoon. I'm Julian Higgins, uh, and I lead the co-lead with Nikki Welton, the sub-theme on systematic reviews and evidence synthesis. 
before we make decisions about our health or the health of others, or before we embark on new research, I presume you would agree with me that it's important to examine the existing relevant evidence that, that is available. And that's exactly what systematic reviews do. Uh, we go out and find everything uh, that, that will help answer a particular question. Uh, and you've seen that, as Jonathan says, there are a lot of these going on in the BRC. One of the bullet points in Jonathan's slide also says that uh, one of our tasks in the theme is to ensure that these are done robustly and efficiently. Now, we're very good at doing them robustly, and I've been very active working uh, with Cochrane and others in articulating and ensuring that systematic reviews are done uh, rigorously to find all the evidence to praise it and get good answers. What we're not at all good at is doing them efficiently. Now, I know a lot of you will know about systematic reviews, but uh, anyone who's not, let me just remind you of the traditional process of doing systematic review. We'll start with a, a question we want to answer, perhaps uh, what's the effect of these magic bullets like vitamin C, vitamin E uh, on health outcomes, as Andy Ness talked about, or what's the predictive ability of placental volume in uh, perinatal outcomes, as we heard about just before T. So we turn this question to uh, the sort of studies that we would hope to find that will help answer that question. And then we search broadly in the literature through PubMed and other databases to try and find all those studies. And we often end up with thousands of abstracts that we read through manually and whittle them down to usually a fairly small number of, of studies that will help us answer our question. Then we look at them and we systematically extract the information that we want and the, and the, the results of those studies. We appraise them to determine the extent to which we should believe their results. And then we'll go and synthesize them to try and get the answer to our question, possibly using a meta-analysis. And we've seen a few of these forest plots in the presentations today. This is boring and time consuming. <laughs> and, and clearly, in the modern era, we shouldn't be spending all of our staff time scanning things. So, so I want to just talk about a couple of areas in which we can make these processes more efficient. And I'm going to talk about applications in systematic reviews of clinical trials because that's where uh, it, it's the easy picking and most of the work's been done there. The first area is, is straddling the searching and the selection of studies. Because a lot of people doing reviews of trials will actually be scanning the same trial reports for different reviews and throwing them in or out uh, and deciding whether they're trials, for one thing. Wouldn't it be better if we just annotated all the trials once and for all so that it's done? And that is happening now uh, in a project through Cochrane led by my colleagues in London and Melbourne, Cochrane Project Transform. I'm just pulling out the, the, uh, the first main output of this, this, this lovely project, what they've got is a, is a big crowd. They're using crowdsourcing. There are 8,000 people in over 100 countries annotating trial reports uh, and, and with multiple people assessing each one so that we get a pretty definitive view to whether it's a trial. And as you can see there, they've got through 34,000 so far. But what's most exciting about this is that these carefully annotated trial reports are being used to train the computers to do their job. And, and the, the system they've built uses machine learning. It's incredibly precise. Uh, well, actually, sorry, very good at identifying trials. Almost 100% of, of the trials it correctly classifies as a trial. So that's, that's a real help. The second area is some work that we're, we, did, we did in Bristol. Well, uh, PhD student Louise Millard, uh, working with me, and Peter Flack in the computer science department, is looking more at the area of collecting information and appraising the quality of trials, where we used machine learning to do assessments of the risk of bias in, in trials. And what Louise did, she took hundreds of um, ex, uh, independent evaluations of risk of bias in trial reports. So you can't read this. It evaluates things like the methods for randomization and blinding and the completeness of outcome data and that sort of thing. And these were taken from Cochrane reviews where they are um, judged to be at high or low risk of bias. And also quotes from the trial reports are brought out. And by throwing those into the, uh, the, the computer, we can train the machine to identify the sorts of words that are associated on the one hand with sentences that tell us about methods and on the other hand, with the actual uh, risk of bias in, in the trial as a whole. And so she's developed a system, and we can now apply it to new trial reports, and we just drop in a PDF into the system. And on the left-hand side, you can see there, it's pulling out sentences that we should read that tell us about the methods, the randomization methods, the blinding, and so on. And on the right, this, this is, is telling us what the predicted risk of bias is for that particular characteristic. So... 
It's, 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 not, it's not fully automated, but it's saving a lot of time. What, we're, what Louise determined is that at least a third of the articles uh, can be classified with at least as much certainty as humans, because humans get it wrong quite a lot. Uh, so what we're doing in the BRC, we're trying to explore, develop, and implement efficient methods um, for the, all the sorts of reviews, not just trials, um, but uh, the, the wide array of reviews done across the BRC. Thank you. Thanks, so I'm just going to wind up this session by um, talking a little bit about the health informatics sub-theme of the cross-cutting theme that um, Jonathan's already told you about. Um, and and, and as, as, as George has already mentioned, um, the overall um, purpose of the, of the cross-cutting themes is not so much um, to make um, discoveries um, uh, 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 ourself in, in, in biomedical research, but to enable other people to make discoveries. And the way that we do that in the, the health informatics um, theme is essentially through providing a platform, um, uh, an informatics platform that underpins uh, the ability of, um, of, 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 of the research themes to deliver their research object, ob objectives uh, through enabling researchers to, um, to use the data they need to do their research in a secure and efficient way. And this is particularly true um, where this uh, research involves linkage between research data, data collected as part of a research project, and uh, routine data, um, data collected um, as part of um, routine care um, that um, not intended for research, but that nevertheless um, has, um, has, has, has the potential to enhance research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the potential of, um, of, 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 of particularly data linkage to enhance observational research, um, and, and then talk a little bit, uh, uh, give an example of, of, of how this uh, potential is being applied in, in the BRC, and then talk a little bit about um, the challenges that should not be underestimated in relation to, to realising this potential. So um, a, a lot of these insights that, that we've gained uh, around um, the idea of, 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 of the different ways that data linkage um, can enhance um, particularly observational research arise through our work over the last 10 years in the project to enhance the ALSPAC cohort uh, through record linkage funded by um, the Wellcome Trust that, that, that I've been um, lucky enough um, to, um, to, to, to lead for the last 10 years. Uh, and... and Data linkage can, poten can potentially enhance uh, the kind of research we do in three principal ways. Probably the first way is through providing um, a relatively low-cost approach to near-whole sample follow-up because most important outcomes that we're interested in are uh, represented in, 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 and are captured in routine data um, because we, we, we live in a society where um, uh, universal health services are used by most people, so most people are represented in routine data. But beyond this, they also um, um, provide us with a means um, to, in a, in a longitudinal manner across the, the, the life course, um, capture um, exposures and, and perhaps dynamic phenotypes that are harder to measure in other ways. I've given a couple of examples there. For example, the exposure to medicines across uh, somebody's uh, life course, also dynamic physiological parameters. It was also interesting this morning, um, um, Caroline's question, to um, Andy Ness about, about the role of, 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 of data linkage and informatics and in nutritional epidemiology. And as Andy correctly said, we don't as yet have reliable ways to measure um, uh, the food that people eat um, across their, their life course, but we are um, actively developing um, ways to um, measure the foods that people buy um, across their life course, for example, through uh, linkage to supermarket loyalty cards, and you can imagine through um, some sort of um, intention to eat um, analysis how, how, how we could use um, these exposures to, you know, c to consider the effects of, of, of diet and health outcomes. And the other thing that, um, uh, that data linkage does is, is, is fundamentally it gives us another approach to reduce missing data not just through um, giving us other ways of getting data that would otherwise be missing, 
but also through informing other approaches um, to missing data, such as multiple imputation, and telling us something about the assumptions that these approaches are based on. Um, and, uh, for example, um, assumptions around um, patterns of missingness and whether these are random or not random. Um, I'm not really going to say um, very much at all about this slide. I mean, this slide, is b b because this, this work in, in, in our cardiovascular research theme is it's just simply an illustration of, 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 of work where some of these, these principles that I've been talking about is, is being actively applied. And, and Gianni and Ben this morning and, and, and Duncan in the last session have already told you about this, this important work um, around predicting um, uh, costly, morbid complications of cardiac surgery with a view to intervening um, earlier. Um, and, um, and, and, and ultimately um, preventing um, the human and, and, and other costs of these, these complications. Um, but, you know, people get terribly excited about, um, about big data and, and, and the potential of big data, and, and, and obviously um, this, 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 this is exciting in, in, in some senses. Uh, but but um, some people, their excitement um, um, has, has perhaps led them into situations where they failed to, um, to um, appreciate and fully consider um, all the challenges um, associated with, with realising the potential of, of big data and health informatics to transform health research. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of, um, you know, f f of, 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 of the fate of the Care.Data programme and, and the difficulties um, that it's ran into. And, and, and I think these challenges, broadly speaking, exist in three main areas. Um, the first area is around getting the permissions um, that we need to access the data that we want, because in many situations, it's either impractical um, to ob 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 obtain um, 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 opt-in individual patient consent, or we know that were we to um, uh, insist on, 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 on opt-in consent being a criterion of, of involvement in our research, we would introduce important sorts of bias um, into that research, and that's not something that we want to do. And, and, and some of the, the challenges in this area, I think, also relate to the rather ambiguous, um, uh, sometimes um, uh, ethical legal frameworks th that surround um, the, the use of, um, of routine data in, 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 in research, and, and, and the fact that these frameworks can be inconsistently interpreted, and also sometimes the failure to make the distinction um, between um, something that is um, legal to do um, compared to something that, um, is, is, that, that has general um, public acceptance as, uh, associated with it. Um, and, and it was perhaps the failure to make this distinction that led to, to the difficulties that the, the Care.Data programme um, encountered. There are also technical challenges um, related mainly to issues such as system interoperability, um, the challenges of, 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 of linking um, and, and integrating data in, in, a, in a situation where um, non-unique identifiers are attached to those data. These sorts of things. I, mean, I, th I think most of these challenges um, are, um, uh, these technical challenges can be overcome, um, but th they should not be um, underestimated. And then finally, there are um, methodological challenges around, you know, once we've got these data, how do we make sense of them and, and how do we make robust causal inference um, based on them? And in some senses, these are just the usual challenges associated with making causal inference in observational epidemiology, but they are further complicated by particular issues of misclassification and missingness and its meaning that can attach um, to um, routine data. But we're working to overcome these challenges. Uh, we're working um, with colleagues in Bristol, uh, particularly in, in relation to the third of those challenges with colleagues in the, um, the MRC Integrative um, Epidemiology Unit um, to, um, to, to, to make robust um, causal inferences based on these data using the, the novel methods that they're developing and applying, but also beyond Bristol, for example, uh, with colleagues in the um, NIHR Health Informatics Collaborative, um, the partnership between um, five BRCs, um, one in each of Oxford and Cambridge, and three in London that we have recently been invited um, to join, which I think will particularly help us um, address some of the challenges in, in, in the first of these two categories. And um, as you've been hearing already, 
and, um, and, and, I, and I, I think we'll continue to hear this afternoon, we're just starting to realise some of the potential of health informatics um, to, um, to, to, to inform and, 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 and in some cases to transform um, health research for um, patient and public benefit. Thanks very much.